It's November the 30th, 1951, in the skies over the Korean peninsula. A formation of nine Chinese Tupolev II bombers rumbles through the clouds, moving towards their target on the island of Chodo. Around them are 16 Lavochkin 11 fighter escorts, keeping them safe through hostile skies. They're cruising along when suddenly a burst of bullets falls from the heavens and tears through one of the bombers. Before the Chinese can even react, the attacker cuts through the formation from above. He's followed by seven more enemies, which pounce on the Chinese aviators. Tracers fill the once calm sky as the Chinese Lavochkin 11s and the American F-86 Sabres clash in a chaotic dogfight. The Sabres quickly find themselves unable to focus on the bombers as they fend off multiple enemy fighters simultaneously. But then a Tupolev II explodes in midair, torn to shreds from below without any warning. The same Sabre from the start cuts through the middle of the bombers fearlessly charging through heavy fire with total disregard for his own life. The mysterious aviator comes right back for another run and fires a single short burst. It strikes dead on target and another bomber bursts into flames. This pilot is squadron leader and World War II ace, Major George Andrew Davis. The tide turns against the Lavochkin 11s. Their pilots are unable to make up for their shortcomings the Chinese squadron is fighting for their lives when a group of MiG-15s arrives to the rescue. The MiGs pounce upon the unsuspecting Americans, their leader easily getting on the six o'clock of the sabre of First Lieutenant Raymond Barton. The MiG fires multiple times, striking the American fighter on the wings and cockpit, but failing to take him down. Barton performs evasive maneuvers as he requests aid on the radio. The MiG's 23 and 37 mm shells are zipping past his canopy. Charlie, on my tail! Charlie, I'm stuck, need help! Copy that. Davis heeds the call. He dives into action and quickly sees the dogfight, but can't differentiate between the two jets. Their profile is just too similar at this distance. Davis Bring orders back. Barton to Bring maneuver back. left and right on his mark. He observes carefully and identifies the plane not following his instructions and pounces. He sweeps down from above and unleashes his six 50 caliber machine guns upon the enemy jet. The barrage strikes square on the enemy's cockpit, taking him out instantly and saving Barton's life. At the end of the day, the squadron suffered no losses and was credited with eight victories. Davis claimed three of them, bringing his tally to five and making him the first ever American to become an ace in two wars. But back at base, Davis is far from the daring and wild killer he is in the air. In fact, he's the complete opposite. He's quiet and reserved, never drinks, smokes, never brags about his accomplishments and skills, despite being a serious candidate for the best pilot of his age. This juxtaposition on top of being a World War II ace made him a legend amongst the force. His experience earned him command of the 334th Fighter Squadron of the 4th Fighter Wing. He excelled at the post, leading by example and demanding strict discipline amongst his men. Under his leadership, the squadron became one of the best battling for the Korean skies. Davis grew to be so valuable that he became irreplaceable. It was protocol for aces to be recalled back to the US for their safety and so they could teach their skills to the next generation of pilots. But Davis is so instrumental in his role that the Air Force can't find anyone to take his place, and so he remains fighting in Korea and seeing more action than ever. Just half a month after becoming an ace, he becomes a double ace, claiming his 10th victory on December the 13th. But that was all to change on February the 10th, 1952. Davis is flying in formation with three fellows from his squadron. They're providing cover for a group of F-84 Thunder Jets across the infamous MiG Alley, where MiG patrols are so common and numerous that Sabres 
rarely venture into it with formations smaller than 12. This is Red One breaking the flights. White search. Davis is feeling confident and had dispersed his 16-man squadron into four-man flights to cover a wider area for the bombers following behind. But just as they approach Mig Alley, disaster strikes in Davis's flight. One of his men, codenamed Red Three, reports an oxygen failure and must return to base. They are arranged in pairs of leaders and wingmen, which means that if Red Three retreats, Red Four must too follow. But they don't have an option and the pair turn back to base and the four-man flight is reduced in half just as they take the highway to the danger zone over the Yalu River. Charging into Mig Alley with nothing but your wingman for immediate assistance would take the breath away for any other pilot. But Davis isn't any pilot and continues with his characteristic fearlessness. His wingman, First Lieutenant Littlefield, is keenly aware of the danger they're putting themselves in, but trusts his squadron leader's judgment and bravely follows without question or hesitation. It doesn't take them long before they spot a five MiG squadron to the north, and then 10 more northwest shortly after. Davis evaluates the contacts and realizes the 10 MiGs are headed straight towards the incoming Thunder Jets. They push the throttle to fall and the pair races to intercept. They approach unseen from above and Davis pounces upon the enemy without hesitation, Littlefield in tow. The MiGs spot them at the last moment and scatter for their lives, but one of them has a split-second hesitation and pays the price. Davis lights him up with his trademark accuracy, striking the enemy and turning it into a flying fireball. Davis pulls out of his dive and instantly lands his crosshairs onto a second target. He pulls the trigger and it too falls under the Sabre's deadly volley. Davis then immediately sets off after a third. It's a daring move. He's lost speed and maneuvering for another kill will only keep him slow and vulnerable. But he's so close and is confident these Chinese won't be good enough to take advantage of it. He keeps up the chase, maneuvering sharply left and right, getting closer to a straight shot. But also, he's bleeding away more and more speed. Unknown by Davis, another MiG unit is patrolling the region far above and among its ranks is Chinese ace Zhang Jihui. They spot the two MiGs going down in flames below them and swiftly dive into battle, Zhang leading the charge. They accelerate towards a swarm of battling planes and tracers, the chaos making it difficult to pick out friend from foe. But in between it all, he spots a single slow flying jet, sporting the unmistakable yellow stripes of a sabre. Davis is still focused on the MiG ahead when a shell strikes him from above. Littlefield is battling hard against the swarm of MiGs when he sees his leader out of control and engulfed in smoke. Enemies descend on the wounded machine and Littlefield rushes to cover him. He desperately fights MiGs off Davis's tail and he follows him all the way down to the ground but no parachute ever opens, and the Sabre crashes into the earth. Lieutenant Littlefield cannot believe his eyes, but before he can dwell on the events, a shell fires past his canopy. The swarm of MiGs is now on his tail. Littlefield slams to full throttle and escapes the scene, dodging shots all over. He dashes left and right, desperately maneuvering for his life, but he can't shake them. There are just too many. In a last-ditch attempt, he sends his sabre straight into the clouds and turns sharply inside them, finally managing to throw off his pursuers. But then the adrenaline wears off and reality of what has transpired sets in. He takes his radio and reports the unthinkable. Base, base, this is Red 2. Red 1 is down. Davis's actions successfully dispersed the interceptors and the bombers were able to execute their mission unopposed. But at what cost? His loss was greatly felt across the Air Force and stateside. By the end of the war, he was still ranked the fourth deadliest pilot of the conflict at 14 victories, only surpassed after his death. With his World War II service, he raked up a total of 21 confirmed victories throughout his life. 
George Andrew Davis would be posthumously promoted to Lieutenant Colonel, as well as awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor and a Purple Heart for his valiant actions on that fateful day, added to the already extensive list of medals he had earned in his life. They would be received by his wife and three children at a ceremony in Rees Air Force Base. If you haven't yet, please subscribe to the channel and please watch more videos of ours. Thank you.